What's going on, everyone? Mike O back with another episode of Hobby Talk. Appreciate you taking some time out of your day to listen to the show. Super thrilled to be joined once again, the return of Brian Roth. Brian, what's going on, buddy? What's up, Mike? How are you, man? I'm doing all right. I appreciate you making your return to Hobby Talk. Definitely uh, excited to chat with you. A lot of stuff going on in the hobby. A lot of stuff going on, you know, in sports-wise as a baseball-centric show for the most part. A fellow baseball fan, I'm sure you're also thrilled at the fact that opening day is literally just days away. Finally, a full season, hopefully. I, I don't see any reason why we shouldn't get that. And we will definitely get into what to expect a little bit and what our thoughts are on the 2021 Major League Baseball season. But before that, we're going to have kind of some big-time news coming out today in the hobby, PSA being heavily involved in that, so we got to get into all that. But before we get into all those topics, I want to give you a chance to kind of mention where people who might be new to you, people who uh, just kind of checking out the podcast for the first time might be able to find you over on YouTube and Instagram, Twitter, if you're doing any of those things. And of course, I know you have a Facebook group as well. I'm kind of all over social. Um, you can find my channel at broth6. Um, on there, I show my personal collection. Uh, lately, it's been a lot of my buys uh, for my inventory, collection breakdowns, things like that. On Instagram, I am at Hank Greenberg Collector. And at Card Soup, C A R D S O U P. Um, you can also look that up on Facebook and find my um, Facebook group in which people get first access to my inventory when it comes in. That way, uh, if you are in part of the, if you are part of the group, um, you are able to uh, see it before it goes elsewhere on the internet. And so, live sales either every week or every other week. And uh, we have fun. So it's a, it's a fun group. Happy to uh, maintain that. And thanks again, Mike, for allowing me to plug. Fun for sure to check out those groups. And I'll definitely get as many links as possible in different areas to where this podcast is posted. Of course, over on YouTube, the YouTube links will be there for sure. Of course, you could be listening over on Spotify or iTunes or SoundCloud or wherever else the feed goes. But make sure you check out B Roth six on YouTube, and I'm sure you can find all the links there as well. So we'll uh, find a way for people to be able to kind of follow you for sure. But the hobby is uh, crazy. The hobby has been crazy for a long time at this point. I mean, it's been getting crazier for the last year, and it's clearly been building for years. But uh, things have just kind of started to boil over to a degree where now. PSA has suspended the majority of and virtually all submissions. Doesn't matter if it's express or a bulk, some sort of special, all suspend it with the hopes of resuming in the beginning of July. So we're looking at three months. Uh, Was this surprising to you, Brian, or is it just something that is kind of long overdue at this point? I think it's the elephants in the room that people kind of thought would always happen or should happen and maybe should have happened a long time ago. Um, I know that, you know, in Steve Sloan's email, he said something like in the beginning of, in the beginning of March, they received more cards in that week than they had in all of 2021 up until that point. (laughs) Um, And I think, you know, knowing that they were already millions of cards behind And then having to then get that much more quantity on top of that. um, I mean, they, they, I mean, even we, even them taking out their estimated turnaround times at this point, there's not enough. Um, And I think we've reached a point of a new normal in the hobby where there is so much overwhelming demand for graded cards in the market um, that, company these great companies are going to have to innovate be creative um and serve their customers in the best way they know how and i think this is a good move by psa i think it's a little late (laughs) um you know uh, having 10 million plus cards in their facility um even some in boxes that haven't been processed yet is just 
it's 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 really hard to 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 fathom that kind of quantity um and i'm sure you know their staff is entirely overwhelmed so i mean listen i i have orders there you have orders there i think everyone at this point has orders at psa that they want back so if this can get that going faster and devote more efforts to what they actually have on hand and not what they're getting in i'm all for it i mean i agree at some point it had to happen at some point you've got to get things going you've got to get things you got to catch up you've got to get things straightened up and you got to kind of figure out what you're going to do and if you're just continuing to be overwhelmed i mean i don't know what else you can do i mean it's been a month since uh the price hike i believe and most of those orders of course still haven't been logged because it's only been a month it's taken them up to three months to log an order let alone start to work on the order let alone get it back i mean you're at best you're looking at year-long waits for what were supposed to be maybe 40-day orders which is ridiculous and unacceptable but at this point the hobby is so bonkers with the influx of new collectors, new investors, flippers, new media, a bunch of um, celebrities or, uh, you know, podcast, just everyone pumping PSA and, of course, the prices and that just, you're going to have new people just sending their stuff and you're going to have people, it's not just the cheap cards, obviously the cheap cards have played a role, but, I mean, if you have a $5 card that, if you spent 10 or 12 bucks to get graded and it became a 50 to $100 card, of course people were going to do it. So it's like, it's one of those things that it just took on a life of its own and it's just demand has continued to build, build, and build. With the rumors, I guess the leak of the price hike, that really uh, did them in. Whoever kind of started leaking that there was going to be a price hike because usually they like to sneak those in. That definitely caused, uh, that might have been what pushed this over the hill where they had to stop because they got, like you mentioned, that influx of cards was just ridiculous and from all accounts uh, kind of broke the uh, post office at Newport Beach and <laughs> just caused caused mass problems for really a community if you think about it. Uh, and they have to devote all this time just to collect those packages, let alone get them open, get them logged, get them graded. So it's something that had to been done. It absolutely some more adjustments should have been done at an earlier time. There's there's really no arguing that. I think they just kind of continued to put it off a little bit and thought they'd be able to handle and didn't anticipate like most people. Um, I think a lot of us were optimistic about the future of the hobby and the way things were going, but I don't think any of us thought the demand for. Uh, and the the price hikes, the price rises, the values of cards, and the demand for graded cards would have grown this much. Otherwise, we all would have been sitting on a lot more. So it's just one of those things. It it kind of is what it is. And if if you're a sole user of PSA, it's super disappointing, I'm sure, because now you have to wait three months. It gives you plenty of time to prepare your orders. But even if they work through some of that backlog and they get things organized, I mean, what's the tidal wave going to be like when they do reopen? So we'll see how they do it. They're going to probably have to open it in tiers and allow certain types of submissions or find a way to uh, not just immediately be overwhelmed right away. And I think this move kind of has it, – it shows that PSA has never and does not have control over their situation. And even going back to, like, the acquisition of Collector's Universe and and the investment group that has bought the company, they have been dealt a really tough hand. I mean, it's one thing to, like, buy – a portion of a business or a business that is booming, but this is an uncontrollable level of, 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 of success. And one that's just at this point, not sustainable. Um, and you know, like, I, I think for all the, the advantages that collectors may eventually get with the leadership 
of the of Nat Turner's investment group with technology and efficiency and you know XYZ, et cetera, et cetera, there's a huge problem with their logistics and uh their operations. Um and hopefully this has shown th- this exercise really has shown them that they got to do something drastic and it was done. They've been a reactionary company for a long time now. I mean, our mutual friend Ed has always complained and always pointed out the PSA turnaround times. And this is kind of like Ed's chicken coming to roost a little bit, you know, like the kind of I told you so. Um, so I'm sure he's like feeling <laughs> feeling good about his uh, his position in, in his critique of PSA. I would uh I would agree with that. I'm sure I'm sure he's feeling like, <laughs> hey, I've been telling you for years. That's if he was on here right now, that's what he would be saying. Absolutely. But it's just it's definitely crazy. Um I mean it's not even obviously they should have moved forward quicker. I know they started to kind of hire people. They like hired twenty people at one point and they could have started up by hiring about two hundred people and all the space and all that. They they were a little slow at that. But right now, it's just the hobby is bonkers and crazy. It's just it it doesn't make sense. And just the amount of attention given to the hobby and PSA is just like hammered into people's heads. It's just it's beyond really their control. Like it's certainly beyond anything they ever anticipated. Uh, The amount of kind of free press that they're getting and, uh, you know, people just doesn't people look at it and they see a card, they go, all right, this is a hundred dollars in a PSA 10. If I'm lucky enough to get a 10 and you look at the other companies, I mean, they just consistently right now bring the highest return. So of course, a large portion of people are going to be like, well, that means they're the best and just, they're going to send it that way. And you know, they're obviously very good at some things, but that doesn't mean that they're the only option. Uh, so but right now, with the amount of people coming in and really just kind of looking at just that aspect of it, not necessarily going, oh, well, does this card fit that holder? Would it fit another holder? How's the service for a specific card? What's the wait time? That's something people don't look at either. They go, oh, 40 days. Oh, it's taken six months. I heard this. And they're not really thinking, well, how long is it going to take to get there? How long is it going to take to log? How long is it going to take to be completed and shipped back and such? So... That backlog has got to be, it's certainly over 10. It might be, it's probably somewhere between 10 and 15. So they're going to have to uh, make some progress on that for sure and kind of figure some other things out, reset in certain areas and be able to uh, to get things rolling again because I don't see any reason the demand won't return immediately as soon as they kind of uh, turn things back on. Yeah, it's a monster and... Um, you know, in Steve's email, he also mentioned that they're still looking to hire. So there are still positions and efficiencies that they've identified that they need to fill uh, and need to get better at. So they also said that they're trying to finally open additional offices around the country to um, diversify uh, their staff, get people in who are um, not just in Fresno and uh, not ask people to relocate for a job and also to you know divvy up the the load 15 million cards if we're calling it that would it, it it might be no one really knows 15 million cards in one facility is a lot of cards and a lot of space um and it, it's like i said before it's just hard to fathom that kind of quantity of cards out there, right? Like ready to go. But you also have to think that like, once they clear that backlog, that's 15 million cards in the market that are ready to sell. They're in a holder. They are ready to go. And that's, that alone's a little daunting and, and scary uh, too. It's a lot of supply. Yeah. And I would assume that a lot of that is ultra modern. So you're going to have a lot oh, of ultra modern hitting the market at some point for sure. So 
it is, uh, it's definitely something to think about, but you probably have a little time before they get through the, all those cards. But, you know, opening, opening across the country, uh, I know they've talked about worldwide setups as well. I mean, that's something that's always seemed to make sense. It's something that they've resisted. I mean, there is a New Jersey office, but that is uh, more for autograph authentication. It just seems to make sense to have more opportunities to bring in talent. I mean, it's a pretty big country, and you're kind of set up in one location where when you look at some of the uh, the rates for sp- different jobs, I mean... It's not really the area that uh, I think most would choose to, uh, you know, take those types of rates. You'd, I feel like you'd have better success in uh, some other areas, but, you know, we'll see how that develops. And you would think just being able to, like you said, spread things out and not have everything in that tight space, whether it's, you know, multiple 60,000 square foot facilities or not, that's still a lot going on in one area. Um being able to kind of spread the wealth out there a little bit seems like it would help uh, efficiency quite a bit. Absolutely. And then with PSA and to transition, I guess, maybe for you, maybe this is against uh, podcast etiquette, but it opens the doors for the four other third-party graders that are trying to break through. And so I know that's on our docket, but Beckett's kind of not made the next step they're still priced a little too high they're still turning around cards very slowly they're not checking things in but for companies like sgc csg hga who's who can meet turnaround times who are still price efficient um and still providing a service to to customers um this is their op this is really their opportunity because P, you know, back in the you know early days of the pandemic in March, where PSA because of their location could not stay open, but SGC because of their location could, being located in Florida, that was their short window of, of advantage. And when PSA kind of realized that, like they got to get back open to get their customers back, that kind of waned a little bit. But it was already a little too late for SGC. But now PSA is not accepting these kinds of submissions for at minimum or a, as as long as three months. That's a long time. You know, people could submit a lot of cards between now and then. And there's a lot of products coming out. I mean, obviously the baseball yeah. baseball releases are starting to roll out. We just had Heritage and in that time frame we would have Series Two baseball. We would have Gypsy Queen. We would have top's finest for sure among others a lot of smaller sets as well and i know nba prism just came out which i'm sure people want to grade as many of those as possible especially if you're dropping two grand on a box you're gonna have to find a way to uh start to recoup those funds and of course you know we'll have football stuff start to come out i'm sure scores around the corner score i think usually comes out in april sometime around the draft so there's going to be plenty of products the products aren't going to stop coming out and people are continuing to rip stuff and people want to get stuff slabbed they want to get stuff graded especially with the influx of new people in the hobby or people returning to the hobby Not everyone has a keen eye or really the experience to kind of evaluate condition on their own. Same thing with people purchasing cards. So it seems like many out there are looking to purchase graded cards um, just kind of to make themselves feel like they're getting what they paid for. Uh, Also to kind of help them price out a card. And the demand is just there for graded cards. So I would certainly expect... uh, SGC and CSG to both get bombarded. Of course, time will tell. We'll see. Hopefully, they are ready to roll with that and fully prepared. We know SGC has expanded facilities. They've expanded the workforce. They've prepared for an onslaught. Let's hope that they are uh, prepared for it and uh, can continue to do things. I mean, if they can continue to roll cards out in 20 to 20 five business days that would be exceptional uh csg we'll see i know their bulks are 60 days 
so we'll see how they uh, handle piles and piles of stuff. I would fully expect at some point there'll be a price hike there. How quickly they're willing to do that, we'll see. But at like $8 a card for a bulk, any era, I mean, they're kind of the bargain right now. They're actually cheaper than GMA. So I would think CSG will uh, will take on a lot. And HGA, uh, while they haven't been around enough or provided enough uh, kind of information, there's not enough to go on to see how accurate they are at grading and such. They certainly have kind of taken the hobby by storm. They've gotten a lot of attention, some good, some bad for sure. But the prices of their cards have sold pretty well. The labels are pretty. People like them. The newer collectors, younger collectors, really are enjoying what they're seeing. So it's really tough to get in their submissions. Granted, you can only do five cards, and they're only taking limited cards during their submissions right now. But, I mean, I think all these companies are vying for a spot at second place. I think everyone just considers BGS number two. They really have been for a while. I know some will argue, well, BGS a little bigger here and there. And there's been shifts uh, over time in terms of certain eras of cards. But I just haven't seen BGS. It feels to me as, as an outsider who doesn't actively use BGS or really seek out their slabs that they just been like sitting in a standstill for really a couple years. I mean, the turnaround time's been just forever. I think they were like a year for bulk submissions a couple years ago at this <clears throat> point, or two years wow. ago, it seemed like. I mean, right now, I think it's at least estimated eight plus months. I think it's like 20 bucks for a card with no subgrades at that slowest service and like 35 if you want it subgrades. And then if you want a faster service, it's a lot more and it's only like an extra couple months quicker. So I definitely yeah. think that number two slot is kind of up for the taking and you know, who's getting this extra market share with PSA kind of holding back for a few months time ultimately will tell, uh, but there are other options out there for sure. I mean, and here's just like a little anecdote about HGA and I'm not an HGA customer. Um, but for a company that is so new into this space for the amount of mistakes that they've had to write up a press release for so far is so bad <laughs> so bad i mean did, did i don't know if you heard but like they had a licensing problem with some of the artwork that they use for some like for one of their labels um and they are now potentially dealing with like a copyright lawsuit. Uh, you know, this company what started a few months ago and like you're and and they're about to deal with like a lawsuit. It's just hard to believe and the, it's, it just seems like they can't stay out of their own way right now. So I I do think that CSG being part of the um the umbrella company underneath uh what is it? CGC uh, it, it really helps their brand for stability, um, and and for long term. And I've i I think the main complaint about CSG right now is the cosmetic appeal of their label. I've seen their slabs and their labels in person, and they're actually not that bad. Um, and I was very close to sending uh an order to CSG, and I still might. I just don't have fifty cards to send for a bulk like like you did and i i'm interested to see how that comes back but um you know for my last two orders i went with sgc just because i i know them i know their process i know their pricing i know uh their turnaround time and i think i went with like the known but i wouldn't be opposed in the future to submitting to csg i was very close to doing it yeah, I, I mean, I haven't seen one in person yet. From what I've seen uh, on video, I think they do look a little better than like that generic like promo shot you see. I will say the ones with subgrades certainly look 
more appealing. I'm not even like a huge subgrade guy. Like, I mean, I can appreciate them, but I've never been like, oh my gosh, I need the subgrades. I just think the blank space in the ones without the subgrades, the flip is a little taller than I think it needed to be. Uh, And like, I don't love the color green, but it is what it is. I'm sure you'd get used to it. I mean, the color red doesn't necessarily match with every card either. We're just so used to seeing PSA flips for the last two decades that you don't even uh, think much of it. Even when SGC came out with a new flip, it was like there were a lot of complaints. And now it's just like it is what it is. It just to me, I just see a card in an SGC holder. I'm like, oh, it's an SGC. So I'm used to it. Um, to me, like the flips, I- I'm always cool with like the most basic looking flips as long as it's presented pretty well. I, I think like GMA, think what you will about their ability to grade or not grade. But like when I just see their flips, like they just look cheap. Like the font is just not not good looking at all. And I, I think that that does play a role. But I do think if people get used to CSG, uh, those flips, I-, I think eventually that won't be as big of an issue. And the amount of conversation that goes on about the flips, and yes, the eye appeal is important, and everyone's going to have um, something that appeals to them. But HGA get in a lot of positive press outside of the uh, mislabeled cards and such, and uh, their issues with some of the artwork, which of course, yes, I have seen. Like people are praising them, oh, these look awesome, but I don't, I don't hear as much conversation about, oh, well, do they know what they're doing when it comes to grading? Like you said, with CSG being under a company that has, you know, done great with paper currency grading and comic book grading and coin grading and uh, all these other aspects in the grading world, I do think helps them in taking on a few former Beckett employees, I think, uh, obviously gives them a lot of experience as well. So I do expect them to be very good, and I kind of look forward to see how they how they do grow. Yeah. The, the one thing that I was thinking about with the CSG holder is it looks like it's built for a modern card, 2.5 by 3.5. I'm wondering if their holder can fit a 52 tops, for example, or 55 tops. We're like a little bigger. They're like... Uh, a little bigger like each way and with the with the uh taller flip like can they fit that card into that holder um i haven't seen a vintage card from that era in the holder and maybe i need to like look a little harder um but to me it doesn't seem like there's space to put a bigger card in there there hasn't been a ton of stuff that's come to market i think the oldest I think like a 60 mantle is like one of the older cards I've seen, which obviously is more of a standard size. So it doesn't run into that issue, but definitely, uh, definitely a question to, uh, kind of look into and see how things are. I would hope that they, uh, you know, had that planned out ahead of time. I know they're still tinkering. I believe they're still working on a thicker, thicker holder for, relic cards and such and i know sgc is still in that process as well i think they have one that's a little thicker but they're working on like a really thick one um as we speak so that's definitely like these other companies they do they do need to come around with some of that obviously beckett uh is probably right now if the place is open they're the place to go with thicker cards but i'm sure everyone will of course adjust in time yeah and you know, I and while we were just talking, I looked up on eBay, and there are 52 tops in CSG holders, so they do fit. I will say though that I don't think they have the appeal that like they do in a PSA or an SGC holder. I just it just does not look appealing to me. So I think there's something to be said there about like how a card can present in a graded hole in, in, like in a holder. And I think there is a level of importance that consumers dedicate toward that. Well, a card, a holder that certainly looks great and vintage pre-war and a lot of modern cards. It's not necessarily the best holder for every card. I don't love them with black bordered cards personally, but SGC, the tux, tuxing up your cards what uh what are your thoughts on kind of the way things are going with them right now? Obviously turnaround times have been amazing for the last several weeks. We'll see how much uh 
influx comes in with, you know, one less option, the most popular option being off the table for a little while, but they, uh, they've certainly been pretty consistent over the years with grading. It's something that, again, you kind of have to decide what you're doing. Are you most worried about how your card will present and how it will look? Are you more worried about how it is graded, how fairly and accurately it's graded, or are you worried about immediate market value there's a lot of factors but kind of what are your thoughts right now with SGC and they're uh kind of going for it for the uh their second big opportunity in the last 12 months well the reason why one of the main reasons why I selected them for my last two orders is uh the opportunity cost you can't turn down an opportunity to get your card graded and pay well, I'll just say this. I paid as much as I paid for my economy orders at PSA, and I don't have any economy orders back from PSA. And I expect to get both SGC orders back next month. And, you know, today is, it's nearly March 31st. And, you know, I expect them both to be back in April. And I think there is an advantage to being like, hey, I have this graded card, depending on what it is. And if your object is to sell that card, which mine would be for, you know, these two orders, you know, like here it is, I have it. I can do what I want with this. I can choose not to sell it now, or I can sell it now. And I have that opportunity to make that choice. Um, so that, that thought like weighed heavily in my decision to go with SGC in that way. The other part that I'm really uh, impressed about with, um, you know, their new, <clears throat> their newest press release is that Peter said that they have the capacity to turn out 3,500 cards in a day. That's a lot. That's a lot of cards. I mean, we were talking before offline, um, about that and, you know, like, do, do you think they receive 3,500 cards in a day? I don't think so. I mean, I mean, maybe on some days they do, if they get like a large bulk order from like, um, the Boca subgroup or like bobbles and ball cards, they do like thousands of cards and and mass, mass, mass quantities. And on maybe on those days they get more than 3,500. But you have to think that like they are getting more cards out per day than they get in per day. Um, and as long as they can keep that efficiency, I don't know how often, I don't know, you know, how long that's sustainable for, but um I mean, even if even if their turnaround time goes from like two to three weeks to three to four or four to five, that's still very acceptable. You know, like there was a time in the summer where there were like people not getting their cars back for three to four months. Um, and their turnaround times on their website was 60 business days. And I think, you know, as long as they can keep that ratio under control i don't see a reason why they're going to fall behind again unless they just get completely flooded and i mean that's i guess that's possible um but i think with the introduction of csg and hga like that's another opportunity for people to send cards to and um you know i'm pretty confident with where sgc is right now i'm excited to get my cards back i think i'm gonna get them back really soon um, and I think I'm going to do well on them. I think at the end of the day, just, you have to submit, especially now, but this always has been the case. If you're submitting cards to get graded, it has to be a quality card. Like you can't send a $5 card to SGC and expect it to be 50 bucks and it gets a 9.5 and you're like, well, wait, I already spent 25 bucks on this and I can only get 15 for it. Well, you're not sending them a nice card. <laughs> you have to send a good card to get graded. That's that. I mean, at, at the end of the day, like you have to send quality. And if your expectation is you're going to turn $5 into $75, you, that's just not possible anymore. It's not, it's not economical. And it, it's just not the reality that, that we're facing now. Um, and so, you know, a lot of people who criticize another grading company because they can't get their 
uh, their fair market value for it. Like, look at what you're sending in. I get fair market value because I send quality cards in. There are a lot of people on 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 my slabs and on eBay that send in quality cards and get quality grades and then get quality prices. And that, I think it just it starts with your selection process. I mean, I think uh, we definitely that. went through a phase in the hobby where the demand was continuing to grow for slabbed cards. People were getting into it. A lot of people were hesitant for a while, not really, you know, uh, I don't know if I want to collect graded cards. And then people started to get into them. And then that's where things kind of expanded, where it wasn't just Hall of Famers or rookies. It's like people started wanted to do, wanted to do, uh, Team collections and player collections getting stuff graded and things have just gone crazy from there and that's what kind of drove the market and the market was so hot for graded cards that people wanted everything graded. But with prices rising, of course, you kind of have no choice but to be more selective. I mean, if you have a card that's only a five ten dollar card, you want to pay up, then so be it, no problem. But obviously, that's got to be something. Uh, you do for yourself. It's just, uh, I guess, the way things are now uh, with the incredible demand for grading. You're going to pay more. And, you know, when I first saw the SGC raise, raise the prices and saw $25 a card, I was kind of got that sticker shock at first. And I was just like, what the hell? Like, if, is it going to be, is it worth my while to send stuff to them anymore? And then the more I thought about it and kind of realized, you know what, the demand for grading just is what it is. Prices have, risen and then i had cards and i'm just like you know what i'd rather pay 25 dollars to get it get a quality grade and i'm not just talking about the number i'm talking about a fair grade you want to get it what it should be and get it back in a quick fashion in a beautiful looking holder and it is what it is am i going to send every card that i would generally like to send because i have to admit i'm the type of person who just loves vintage cards slabbed I would send up, send out vintage common fillies to places because it was like seven bucks to get stuff graded. I figured, what the hell? What am I gonna? What do I have to lose? Seven bucks? I could easily get that money back if I decide to sell it. Well, when the price is twenty five, whether it's PSA or SGC or Beckett or whoever, I mean, you do have to think about it. It's like, well, I really do want this one graded. I'll get it graded. But then there's others. You're like, eh, you know what? maybe a top loader will do just fine. And that's the rub, right? Like, and and that's another aspect of like PSA increasing their prices and now shutting down their service that the, the true collector, the, you know, the guy who attends the card show and digs through a dollar box or does a set registry in, in, in hopes of, you know, completing their set um, and doesn't sell anything in hopes to profit off of the hobby. Th these changes are impacting them, that population, the most. Um, you Well, now you can't send it, but even, for, even from March 1st until today, it was, it became really hard for a set collector to complete a registry set if they're working on it um and if they're sending the cards themselves um and now and now they and now they can't send those cards um and if they do you know come july 1st they're gonna wait a year <laughs> and that's just not appealing to a lot of people especially a collector who wants to have their cards back but i remember john you know john mangini subbed cards to SGC and he he was so frustrated with their turnaround times when they were really struggling to just get his cards back in his hands because he doesn't like them leaving he wanted some reholders done he wanted some other stuff graded but the fact that they were outside of his possession for you know three four months was not ac acceptable to him he wanted his stuff back and he's a true collector. He doesn't sell cards to fund other parts of his hobby. He, he buys stuff and he holds it for forever. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he was pretty displeased with his SGC experience, but I think that illustrates how 
how the how the true collector now is getting really squeezed and hopefully they can stay in because at the end of the day like people got to buy cards people got to sell cards to like make this thing keep going people got to open packs and the true collector is the one is like the end user right like it's not me who gets a card in one day and sells it another day that's that i enable collectors to buy their cards because without me they don't have a channel to do that or people like me they don't have a channel to do that but without the end user without the without the 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 collector that card just bounces around and there doesn't doesn't have a home until it reaches that person's hands and so i think it's important to keep the true collectors best interest at heart and i hope that these grading companies and you know, et cetera, are, are doing that because if we ostracize them, then it's going to spell the end for the hobby really fast. No doubt. And I definitely want to give SGC credit for eliminating that backlog and kind of seeing, you know what, they talked a big game and they got behind. There's no denying that. Obviously, they've self-admitted that. They got behind. They got more stuff in than they could handle. Last year, they've made... Uh, changes to hopefully avoid that happening again and definitely look forward to seeing them succeed. Uh, that's definitely something that, you know, you turning down some business for a while and kind of, they never stopped accepting submissions. That's something that I feel like a lot of people have put out there. They, they just weren't doing bulk submissions. They weren't doing bulk pricing. You could send them 500 cards if you wanted to. It was just going to be full price. Uh, which obviously was discouraging people from doing business with them at the time. But they knew that they had to fix a problem rather than just let it go on for a year or two or three. So I give them a ton of credit for that. And I uh, certainly look forward to some of the submissions I have out right now. Right now I have submissions out with everybody except for BGS. And I have no expectations of getting my PSA ones back for at least a few more months and these are cards that i've been waiting on for six seven eight months already uh csg definitely expecting like maybe by may and uh sgc i'm feeling pretty optimistic that you know two three weeks i could uh see something back and hga who knows you don't really get an update from them but we'll uh we'll see i'm just hoping that they uh are graded accurately and uh None have to go back for new labels, which is a common problem with grading. Definitely want to make that clear as well. I've done a lot of business with PSA over the years, and I constantly have to go through that process of getting cards reholdered, uh, labels fixed. But obviously that happens from time to time. But when you're a brand new company and you're doing some custom labels, it's definitely going to stand out a little more, and you kind of have more to lose at that point. So... It is uh, a little concerning. Hopefully, hopefully that will be fixed. SGC, I've had very little. I think I've only had to have like three cards ever, um, the the flips fixed. So they've actually been very, very good at that, very thorough. But there are a lot of options out there, and I guess that's one of the points I wanted to make. I, for a period of time as a as a collector, you know, I got into the grading and I got stuck in that PSA tunnel vision which I can tell you right now, the majority of the hobby appears to be in. And I'm not saying anything anti-PSA. I, I enjoy their holders. I actually, from a feel perspective, just grabbing it in the hand, the PSA holder is probably my favorite. They just they have those sleek, light holders. Um, but I do love the look of SGC as well. So I, PSA, SGC, they're my two favorite holders for sure. I, I like their flips. Um, but eventually, you just you got to branch out and realize like there are other options and some are better than others. Uh, SGC is probably the better option for a pre-war card. Uh, PSA might look better for others. Or if you're doing a set registry, clearly the, the number one, probably the only choice for that. Some thicker cards might be better in BGS. I don't love the BGS holder. Obviously some people do. I expect CSG to do a great job. I can't say that uh, conclusively yet because I haven't gotten anything back from them and I haven't even seen or held a one of their holders in my hand. 
HGA look great, but what kind of history do they have to tell you that they are experts in grading? They might know cards. Are they experts? Time will tell. So there's a lot of options out there for sure. Yeah. And, you know, we have, you know, the community has you to thank for your experimentation. Like you're sending cards everywhere. And um, it'll be interesting to see you, your thoughts. I mean, you have your opinions now, but when you have your finished product back in your hand, it's going to be interesting to hear your thoughts. But I actually wanted to ask if you had heard of this. So when I was subbing through PSA, I used PC sports cards. And they said yesterday, they got an email from PSA that um, a card that they had formerly graded was cracked because they identified the card as being in their system already through a scan um, and asked if they had the original cert to grade, to holder it again. And if they didn't, they would send it back raw. So it seems like PSA is going to be trying to put a stop to cracking and resubbing, especially for serial numbered cards, um, which, you know, in, in, in all, also in a way would help, um, deter people from trimming and altering cards, sending them back in to get graded if they've already been holdered by PSA. Um, have you, ha had you heard of that? I did hear that story earlier today that it had happened with uh, PC sports cards, but in the past, I haven't seen that happen. Obviously, it has happened where people have cracked and sent from Beckett to PSA and then maybe to PSA twice and such. I know some of the uh, guys out there the uh, that are doing all the research on blowout and stuff have kind of showed different examples in the past, but I do remember hearing that they were going to kind of try and uh, do see what they could do about that. And serial number cards, obviously very easy to identify. I mean, if you're just cracking like base Shohei Otanis and resending them, I don't think they're going to have much of a way to control that. But to me, back in the day, I could see why people did it. I never actually got a card, grade it, didn't like the grade, cracked it, resent it. I know a lot of people do that. To me, it was just never worth it. Um to try and get a 9 to a 10. The price difference was never as substantial as it is now, uh, but to me it was never worth paying the grading fee again, not knowing if it would actually get a higher grade. Like I just, I personally never saw the point to doing it. Certainly if you had a much more expensive card and it was that big of a difference, I could see it, but I think it's, it's probably good uh, – that PSA start doing it, it kind of saves a lot of time and it, it saves from people having more opportunities to uh, kind of try and pull a fast one and correct uh, potential problems as well. Like you said. Yeah. I mean, if that, if that's, if that's what they're going toward, I mean, the, the days of cracking a PSA holder and resubbing are quickly coming to an end. Um, and uh, I think that's an interesting aspect that people, uh, you know, take advantage of. And if they're cracking down on that, that's, that's a lot of cards that they won't have to deal with again. So, yeah. And I mean, I mean, I get it. The high price cards. I mean, I feel like you should have a pretty good idea with. I certainly think there are certain cards that on any given day, especially without that nine and a half tweener grade. I think it's definitely there. There are cards out there that on one day could be a nine and another day could be a 10 or it could de depend on the grader. But most of the time, those cards are just, they're kind of your run of the mill cards. And I don't know, the difference can be big for that 10, but I just never found it. Like, would you crack a card right now and send it back in, pay that big time fee and wait a year to get it back? Is that worth your time? And let's say, say it's like a Fernando Tatis Topps Chrome rookie which is, I don't know, I'm, I don't even know the prices, but let's say a PSA 10 is 300 and a 9 is like 100 bucks. Is it worth your time to spend $50 and wait a year to try and get a 10? To me, probably not, but to others, perhaps. Yeah, I think it just depends on your investment in the card. But the Tatis Chrome 10 is up to like 450 It's kind of high. Um, a little pricey that's because the popper is so much lower than the paper 
And uh, it might remain that way for at least a little while longer based on the way things are going, but we'll see what the yeah. future holds. The days of sending off a pile of rookie cards, um, just taking a chance, might be gone, but it doesn't mean it didn't pay off. Um, I definitely have uh, quite a few Tatis 10s that I sent off back in the day, and that's one of my things, too, with people criticizing what people get graded. Ultimately, it's whoever's grading the card. It's kind of their choice, and I, I get it. Like Everyone has their ideas of what they should get graded, but I, I remember in the past, like people going, why are you getting all those Tatis cards graded? They're like $5 cards, mm-hmm. and it's like, well, I bet you wish you got your Tatis cards graded back uh, you know, a year or two ago. <laughs> Another thing that uh, has been hot in the hobby lately is baseball. Baseball stuff has kind of been going crazy. I know a lot of people I've seen, I I listen to different things and people talk about basketball, the market is cooled temporarily. And of course, football is kind of out of sight, out of mind at the moment, but baseball spring training has been going strong. The season is upon us. Vintage is going crazy. The new guys are going crazy. Some of these prospects are going crazy. Brian, what are you looking forward to in baseball 2021 on the field? Hobby wise, just kind of some of your thoughts on the upcoming baseball season. Finally, a full season is upon us. We we don't have to wait till August this year with that uncertainty of if we're even going to have a season. I mean, I think the emergence of so much young talent in the game is so exciting. I don't know if there's been such a a, a collection of young really talented baseball players maybe ever in the game's history um all this all at the same time it it seems like almost really since like maybe even 2011 when trout came in i mean he came up with guys but then like he was followed then shortly thereafter by like the judge and the bellinger and then i mean you just go year by year and multiple rookies have emerged from each year i'm really excited to see what cabrian hayes can do in a full in a full season he looks like an absolute stud and i think the benefit that he has that a lot of players don't is that his dad was a baseball player so i think the the guys in the game who who are sons of former major leaguers already have a leg up and we're seeing a lot of success from guys whose dads used to play already. And I think it kind of just makes sense, right? Like they grew up around baseball. They have watched their dads play. They are probably in clubhouses back in the day um, and just have absorbed so much baseball knowledge and have played for so long already that they just have more experience even as a young player than others do. And so I'm really excited to see Cabrian Hayes Um, excited to see him boom in a full year. If he can continue, um, you know, hitting at the clip that he did last year. Uh, Dylan Carlson's an exciting player. I think Kellenic will be called up in April. Um, So, you know, unfortunately, as a Mets fan, I'd love to have him in our outfield, but um, Brody had some other uh, some other thoughts. That's that's <laughs> definitely Robinson probably a move Cano. you wish you could take back, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, having Cano and Edwin Diaz, <laughs> it's a pretty rough trade for the Mets. So, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, it's going to be a great year. We say that all the time, but uh, now more than ever, the stars are younger and more talented and more dynamic than ever. I think that's the most exciting part of the game. Yeah, we definitely need excitement in the game and the young stars for sure. Kind of that uh, the youth certainly brings excitement. Uh, just having a full season to me is exciting. Last year was tough. I mean, it was a tough year in general, obviously, for obvious reasons. Um but like as a baseball fan, as a diehard baseball fan, it was like you were gearing up. You were in that spring training kind of thought process and looking forward to the season. And I remember at a certain point going, like thinking to myself, like, oh, opening day is going to be really weird. They're not going to have fans there 
like what is going to happen? And then before you knew it, there was the two week de- delay that you kind of didn't know if that was really uh, something that was going to happen or temporary. And of course it was temporary. And then it was the indefinite suspension and really not knowing like if or when the season was going to start. Obviously the players and owners had their ridiculous spat that went on as well. But you know, certainly finally we got the 60 game season. I was thrilled to have any type of season, enjoyed the postseason, but like knowing we have a full year to me is uh, really exciting for many reasons. Just to be able to, as a Phillies fan, uh, being able to count on coming home and watching a game every night. I mean, I, th- I think that's important. I think that's something that's one of the best aspects of baseball. When, when I hear people complain about the length of a baseball season, I'm like, oh, you're not a baseball fan, are you? Yeah. Uh, that's what I thought. You're, you're kind of like a take it or leave it. Like for me, I personally could care less if hockey season were 10 games or 200 games because I just don't follow a lot of hockey personally, but that's just me. Um, but baseball-wise, like that's one of the best aspects of it, that it's night in and night out. You have that to look forward to. It's not just you know getting through your week to watch a game once a week. So I look forward to six months of being able to count on watching uh you know your favorite team play but then also being able to look forward to watching other games on MLB Network or ESPN um seeking out the stars and kind of new blood uh different teams like whoever was excited to watch the San Diego Padres like the Padres have been probably the most boring team in baseball <laughs> the entire course of my life like yeah you had Tony Gwynn like Tony Gwynn a lot but like boring uniforms like not an exciting team they probably played in the most boring world series of all time back when they played the yankees what was that 99 um yeah like i remember i'm trying to think i think i was in high school then i think it was like exam like i exam sometimes and like next thing i knew it was like the world series is over i was like i didn't even get to enjoy it but now they they have these new uniforms that look great they have just a team full of young stars you have fernando tatis one of the most dynamic players in baseball one of the most dynamic young players in baseball obviously just a ton of potential manny machado who's like super overlooked now in the hobby almost i mean some people love him some people hate him of course but like he's a fantastic player puts up great numbers has put up pretty damn good numbers for his age like future hall of fame type of numbers they just have a ton of young talent obviously the dodgers finally won their world series loaded with talent even in the division that we both follow teams in like you have juan soto ronald acuna jr in the same division you have the mets have acquired francisco lindor they've brought in some new talent the phillies still have a guy like bryce harper they retain jt real muto like there's a lot of talent and the Marlins, who most pick for last place, like, granted, it was a shortened season, but they found a way to make the postseason last year, and they have a dynamic young pitcher in Sixto Sanchez. So it's like, yeah, even the bad teams have reasons to watch and reasons to be excited. So, and obviously just ignored, like, most of the divisions in baseball right there. But there's just so many fun young players to watch and just incredible talent. And I just think it's going to be a ton of fun. And it's going to be a roller coaster as the season goes along with the hobby stuff, with the reaction you see, like from week to week in the NFL or in the NBA from game to game. Guys are going to go on like 10 game streaks of crushing the ball. Aaron Judge hits seven home runs in a 10 game stretch. What's going to happen with those rookie cards? I mean, it's going to be kind of fun to follow for sure. There's, there's a lot of predicting going around. I, I follow a few baseball channels on youtube and a lot of them right now are like predicting team wins over under um and will be award winners how the playoff picture is going to shake out and i think just think there's a lot of general excitement it's it's been a while since we've had regular baseball season so i think there's just a lot of a lot of excitement around the season i i can't wait i mean the mets play Thursday night against the Nationals. I don't know who the Phillies play, but I'm sure you'll be glued to the TV watching. 
I uh, I absolutely will be watching them face off against the Atlanta Braves and just like cross my fingers nice. that Acuna, you know, <laughs> holds off like a couple games before he, you know, starts hitting home runs and such. But it's yeah. just going to be awesome. And like the process, it's like you talked about how much young talent there is already in the majors. Like, look how much more is coming and when will these guys be called up? Uh, a guy like Wander Franco and some of the yeah. guys in Seattle, you mentioned Kellenick, but uh, Julio Rodriguez as well. Just so many prospects. Andrew Vaughn, I believe, I saw made the White Sox, so he'll get his crack at the big leagues. It's going to be it's gonna be fun to follow and watch the games on the field, which, of course, is incredibly important if you're a sports fan. But having that dual passion for the sport as well as the card hobby, you have a lot of excitement to see like where the market goes with some of these guys and when do some of these guys uh once they make their major league debut what will be their first cards will they make a series two appearance will they be held out for a tops update obviously some of it depends on when you come up and which guys will bounce back does a Jordan alvarez kind of come back and hit 30 40 home runs mm. after hitting one home run last year of course due to injury and a shortened season like there's just so many storylines to follow this, and and also like Christian Yelich, like don't forget that like two and three years ago he won MVP and then in nineteen he should have won the MVP. I think he outperformed Bellinger, um, you know, for the entire stretch of the season. But this is a guy who like has come off the two best years of his career and last year didn't find it. But through all of that, he still hit the ball hard. He's still. Um, made contact he just struck out a lot um and maybe that's a juxtaposition you can't make contact and strike out a lot but, but um you know i think like the hard hit percentage is a key indicator like when you hit the ball are you making outs and when you hit it hard how many outs are you making um so like with hayes a guy who i'm buying a lot of right now um his hard hit percentage uh, was up there. I think he was like top three in this in in the league last year in all of baseball, and I think that translates. You know, like this is a dude who plays a corner infield position, and he he smokes the ball. He's an elite athlete already <clears throat> in baseball, and I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of attractiveness that comes with features like that, especially with cards. And his first rookie card, pack pulled rookie card, I believe, is out of twenty twenty one Topps Heritage Baseball, correct? Uh no. You can actually get his silver pack um in series one. Um, but his but his Bowman rookie his Bowman first was back in twenty fifteen. So he's been around for a while. And um, you know, he's 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 kind of been the guy that like hasn't made noise because he's been on the pirates and like sorry Bob Lewis but like Pirates not like the face of the NL Central and so he's been overlooked and then he came on last year and like really opened a lot of people's eyes yeah I I've think kind of followed him from a distance for a while with him being Charlie Hayes son uh Charlie Hayes spent some time in Philadelphia so yeah. definitely always kind of followed Cabrian a little bit and excited to see him reach the big leagues have some success and potentially have a big 2021 and watch his uh card market go bonkers who knows you never know mm -hmm. what to expect in the hobby anymore because who would have thought some of the prices we see now where refractors of rookies from two years ago are like a thousand bucks <laughs> i'm just thankful yeah. every day that i'm a baseball collector uh more so than a basketball collector because then i don't even understand how you're involved in the hobby when guys are asking like a thousand bucks or a box of Donruss, could you imagine? No, no. And I think like at some level, if you are collecting or you are investing or you buy and sell as a living, you kind of choose your engagement. Like there are certain eras of sports cards that I don't engage in. Like modern basketball, like ultra modern basketball, I don't care about who Colin Sexton is. I don't care about who, um, like, I don't care about LaMelo Ball. I just don't. <laughs> and, you know, like, I don't, I can't keep, like, I can't keep up with, with that. Like, why are Prism rookies from 2018 
so expensive. There's no reason. And uh, straight I, hype. I, it's all just oh, hype course, right now. Yeah. I mean, like that stuff. That stuff doesn't last. Um, you know, I I choose to go after like the pro- the more proven talent and like take some gambles on some young baseball players who, for me, pass the eye test. I've been watching baseball like all my life and feel like I can pick out who's going to be good, who's not going to be good. And uh, those are the kind of guys I like to buy. Yeah, it's a crazy hobby, and you definitely have to kind of pick and choose what you're involved in. It It's near impossible to be involved in everything, and more so than ever with the with the popularity. There's a lot of great things that come with it. If you have a large collection, it's risen in value for sure. But at the same okay. time, with the popularity and the hobby comes more competition, whether you're looking to just pick up some base top Series 1 you might have to look a little harder at your local retailer, or if you want to break of a break a different product that's a hobby exclusive, you're gonna to have to pay a little more. If you like getting cards graded, you're gonna pay more. You're gonna wait longer in most cases. So mm-hmm. this is kind of the way things are right now. Doesn't mean it'll last forever, uh, but I'd certainly uh, be careful with some of the rookies. You definitely want to make sure if you're paying the big dollars, uh, the ultra modern guys. You want to make sure you watch the guys on the field and make sure you uh, actually like that player or believe in that player because there's certainly a lot of money that you're investing in, whether you're investing to invest to hope that it rises in value or if you're just investing your time and money into adding to your collection because there's certainly a bigger price to pay than ever before. So yeah, I've said it over and over again, the hobby is bonkers and just crazy and I really don't know any other way to put it. It almost seems like every month or like every time you do a hobby talk podcast, there's a new topic to discuss a new current event, a new, like, why is this happening? A new, I can't believe this is happening. It's tough to keep up, but it's also very entertaining. (laughs) I mean, there's never a dull moment in this hobby anymore. No. I mean, there's just always something going on. There's either someone grading is closing down shop for a period of time or uh, prices are spiking on someone else to some exponential level or there's just there's always something. But it's been a, a fun chat. Brian, appreciate you taking some time to hang out, talk a little bit about the PSA news, provide some thoughts on that, some of the other options potentially for grading, and just you also have to look at that too. Um, You don't have to get everything graded. I know it's kind of fun to to grade. It can become addicting to grade stuff, but sometimes a top loader works just fine. Sometimes a nice magnetic works for certain cards. So a lot of ways to collect and in, enjoy the hobby, but there are options to get stuff graded. And you know, if you are diehard PSA, hold off and wait a few months. If you're ready to give someone else a chance, try them all. I think it's definitely worth uh, submitting and kind of testing the waters with other companies. Uh, and of course, talking a little bit about, about the 2021 season. So, Brian, thanks again for joining me for this episode of Hobby Talk. No doubt, buddy. Look forward to number three when we get the when uh, when we get there. I'm sure uh, at some point we will certainly get there. Appreciate everyone listening. Let us know what you thought in the comments down below. Depending on where you're listening, you can check it out. Check out Brian on YouTube, B Roth. Check out Card Soup as well. All have links all over the place. So thanks for listening as always. Talk to you next time. Have a great one.